Hi, this is Dr. Kate Crowley from Teachers College, Columbia University in New York City. This course, Ethical Practice Through Evidence-Based and Culturally Responsive Disability Evaluations, Clinicians, Supervisors, Administrators, and Researchers as Agents of Change is a five-module course. This is module one, What Does the Research Tell Us?, where I'm joined by my colleagues, Kine Sedler, Dr. Katrina fulcher and Dr. Chelsea Summer. This is the disclosures for the course. So we'll get right to it. Why do SLPs continue to use standardized tests to identify a language disorder when the most widely used tests focus on whether the child has acquired the morphology of one variety of English, standard, general, mainstream American English, and whether they've acquired certain vocabulary words. We know the morphology of standard American English is only applicable to kids who have been brought up speaking that variety of English, but there's many varieties of English in the United States. And we also know that vocabulary acquisition is highly linked to the students' fam at families' socioeconomic level and the parents' educational level. So why are we using these two measures to identify whether a child has a disorder or not? Look, the use of longstanding tests, we do one test, we get the next one. When the revision comes out, we're familiar with that, we do the next one. Why this use of longstanding tests may save time, it can prevent SLPs from using tests based on cutting edge research. Many of the currently used tests, such as those that focus on the morphology of standard American English or vocabulary items that are assumed to have be um, acquired by kids from mainstream American middle-class school or ancient cultures. Um, they are based on theories of how to identify language uh, disorders that now are 30 and 40 and 50 years out of date, but they were cutting edge when they came out. But wait, don't we have to make sure that a child acquires general American English, the language variety of power and money in the United States? Yes. But it's not a job of the speech language pathologist, and no student should be identified as having a language disorder simply because they have not acquired standard American English. Remember, what we're looking for is whether the child has a true language disorder, and that would be evidenced if they did not acquire the, the language norm, the variety of English or the variety of whatever language they've been exposed to in their home and community. But how would we do that? We'd have to get a background information, then we'd have to get a language sample. But many SLPs do not regularly use language sample elicitation and analysis in the clinical practice or have the skills to do so. But wait, don't we call ourselves the language specialists? Don't we have our language lens? Why don't we speech language pathologists know language? Maybe SLPs do not have the skills to analyze language structure, how to analyze clauses and subordinate clauses and identify what they are. Look, in our field, we have prerequisite courses in speech science, hearing science, but not in language science. And normal language development or typical human language development is quite different than having the skills to actually deep structure analysis, analyze this, the language sample that a, a child produces. Well, that's a course we could all use, language science. Maybe it's what's still taught in most CSD master's programs about language. If the child doesn't have Brown's morphemes, here's Brown's morphemes, then they have a language disorder if they're this age. But again, it's one variety of English. Uh, they're taught how to give and score standardized tests without looking at whether those standardized tests are valid, reliable, free of bias. Uh, and, may, and they might be taught salt and sugar when those are the software and language programs. The problem is if the clinician doesn't know how to code the deeper structures of language, they generally just pop out the uh, number of different words and type token ratio, which has to do with richness of vocabulary, which is highly linked to socioeconomic background and parents' education, and MLU, which is highly linked to the morphology of standard American English. Maybe it's a misunderstanding in the field of what's required by the federal law. Maybe it's just easier to buy and give and score tests. Maybe clinicians don't read the research. 
in a 2013 very sad study. Um, 2,762 SLPs responded to a survey, and the majority read only zero to four ASH of journal articles a year. Maybe clinicians do not use evidence-based practice for assessment. In one recent study, the school-based SLPs reported they used evidence-based practice for treatment, but not for assessment. Whatever the reason, this is not a reality for those of us who are interested in, in addressing systemic racism and implicit bias in our field can accept. As John McWhorter wrote in the New York Times on October 7th, 2022, the article was called A Language Test That Stigmatizes Black Children. For Black children be designated as linguistically deficient right out of the gate based on notions such as if they don't always use the verb to be, they don't understand how things are related, makes no sense. It constitutes a dismissal of eager and innocent articulateness. And as such, it is an errant and thoughtless injustice and must be stopped. Dr. Moore McWhorter continues, speech pathologists thinking to meaningfully participate in anti-racism must start not just questioning, but resisting en masse these outdated tests that apply a Dick and Jane sense of English on real kids who control a variety of coherent and nuanced Englishes. So here are the modules for the SLP change makers who I've invited to be part of this course. Module one, what's happening with the research. Module two, how to actually do a quality evaluation. Module three, who are the clinicians who've made changes so that they can provide culturally and linguistically responsive and evidence-based evaluations. Lead SLPs, supervisors, and researchers who have changed how things are done. And supervisors and administrators who take that broader approach on how things are done. So how do, does any of this relate to ASH's code of ethics? What does ASH's code of ethics have to do with the accuracy of speech language disability evaluations? Well, it says individuals shall comply with local, state, and federal laws and regulations applicable to professional practice and to the responsible conduct of research. The code of ethics uh, brings in the federal law. And here's what the federal law says. The federal special education law, IDEA 2004, requires that all assessment materials be valid and reliable and free of cultural and racial biases. Additionally, evaluation materials must be able to distinguish a true disability from lack of adequate instruction in reading and lack of adequate instruction in, in math and from limited English proficiency. Look, but I was never taught is no excuse. I was never taught my master's program. Um, individuals, principle one of um, rule of ethics, rule A, is um, individuals shall perform all clinical services competently. It also, principle one, rule C, individuals shall not discriminate on the basis, on the, in the delivery of professional services. We can't discriminate on the basis of natural origin, including culture, language, dialect, and accent, or on race, on a number of other issues and identities, but the ones that are most important for this particular course are these. And rule L, individuals who hold the certificate of clinical practice shall use independent and evidence-based clinical judgment, keeping paramount the best interest of those being served. Principle of Ethics 2, Rule C, says individuals shall enhance and refine their professional competence and expertise through engagement and lifelong learning applicable to their professional activities and skills. So I can't discriminate, and if I don't have the skills, I must engage in learning them. But my supervisor says I have to is no excuse. Individuals in administrative or supervisory roles shall not require or permit their professional staff to provide services or conduct clinical activities that compromise the staff's members' independent and objective professional ju judgment. So if your supervisor or administrator has their ASHA Cs, they cannot require you to do things that compromise your independent and objective professional develop, uh, judgment. And then uh, SL, uh, supervisors who have their ASHA Cs can't knowingly allow anyone under their supervision to engage in any practice that violates the ASHA Code of Ethics. 
under the ASHA Code of Ethics, there are no buts. We cannot engage in discriminatory practice. We need to learn what we don't know to ensure we don't discriminate. We need to follow federal, state, and local laws and regulations. And as you probably know, the federal government's IDEA is the, sets the standard for evaluations and states can uh, meet or exceed that standard, but they can't go below it um, unless they would choose to not receive special education money under IDEA 2004, and there's not a single state that has done that. We need to follow evidence-based practice. And we need to use our independent and objective professional judgment. For disability evaluations to meet the standards of practice in ASHA's code of ethics, the clinical practice has to change. In this course, we'll hear from clinicians, professors, professors, lead SLPs, administrators, and policymakers who are moving the clinical practice away from standardized test scores to culturally responsive, more accurate and ethical assessment practices. You will hear courage, compassion, logic, and determination. The field is changing in the area of speech language disability evaluations. Here are some of our professions, SLP change makers. Hello everyone, my name is Kine Sudler and I'm a bilingual speech language pathologist. I currently work at a Title I school in Bushwick, Brooklyn. The population of my school is so diverse. We have a lot of Black, African-American, Caribbean students, and students who come from Spanish-speaking homes. So I'm always hearing different kinds of language in the hallways um, as I'm walking through and rushing to pick up my students for our sessions. Today, I'm going to be talking about language varieties and considerations for assessment. So, we first have to agree on one fact, and that is that language varies. It's always changing. It never stays the same. Think about if you picked up a book by Chaucer or sat down to listen to a play by Shakespeare. The type of English that you would hear in those texts is so different from the type of English that we use today. Or take a moment to talk to your parents, your grandparents, the slang they use is going to be different from the words and the terms that your children or your students are using. What about technology? Words like Google, Tweet, Selfie weren't even invented 20 years ago. And social context matters. We're going to speak differently if we're talking to our friends and our family than if we're talking to our bosses. So language varies. It should come as no surprise then that we have many different varieties of English in the United States. The exact terms that we use to label these varieties are constantly changing, but here are some common ones. African-American English, Appalachian English, Spanish-influenced English, Chinese-influenced English, right? And again, it doesn't mean, for example, that only African-Americans speak African-American English or that that's the only variety they speak. These are just the terms that are commonly used. So these language varieties are not random. They're not arbitrary. They're patterned and they're rule governed. That means that when we hear differences in phonology and sound, when we hear difference is differences in syntax or when we see differences in vocabulary, those are all based on a rule governed pattern system. These varieties and others like it are often called non mainstream varieties of English in comparison to a variety that we typically call mainstream American English or standard American English. What is that? That's the language that we are encouraged to use in formal situations, such as at jobs or at an interview. That's the language that we're often going to hear newscasters use. It's the language that we're encouraged to use in schools. It's the language that our students are going to see on most of their high stakes standardized assessments, mainstream American English. <laughs> 
does the fact that mainstream American English is used in so many contexts mean that it's better? Definitely not. There are issues of power, there are issues of social class that contribute to the social value of mainstream American English that we have today. In fact, all language varieties are intrinsically and inherently equal. No variety is better or worse than any other variety. This is something that I saw when I was scrolling through social media. I don't judge people based on race, creed, color, or gender. I judge people based on spelling, grammar, punctuation, and sentence structure. It's supposed to be a joke. It's supposed to be funny, but is it? The language that we speak is intimately connected to who we are. So if people are judging us based on the way we speak, then they are judging us based on our identity as well. Let's look at Ash's position statement on social dialects from 1983. I especially wanna talk about this bold portion. No dialectal variety of English is a disorder or a pathological form of speech or language. In other words, a language difference is not a language disorder. So it's our job as speech and language pathologists to discriminate between a language difference versus a language disorder. And I especially like the way that Odding and other researchers put it. We need to identify if there's a disorder within an individual's unique dialect. So what happens when the tests we use to determine language impairment are designed for mainstream American English speakers? Well, that's when we get a lot of misdiagnoses. We have typically developing students who speak non-stream main, non mainstream varieties diagnosed as having language impairments, or we have those students diagnosed as not having language impairments when they in fact do have one. This is unacceptable, it's unethical, and we're not going to do that. What about scoring modifications? You may think, okay, I have this standardized assessment. What if I just give the child credit for responses that are correct in their dialects, but incorrect in mainstream American English? Well, there are some challenges and some problems with that approach. First, scoring modifications can be applied for production tasks where the child is speaking, producing something, but not comprehension tasks. Second, a number of items the number of items affected by modifications can vary greatly depending on the task. So you might have some tasks which encourage more speaking and hence you might see different amount of non-mainstream American English features being used. Also, speakers differ in how often they use these features and they may not use all of the features within a particular dialect. There's variation. Some are not as frequent, some are not as common. Finally, there's limited research available on how modifications affect diagnostic accuracy, meaning how well we are discriminating between st students who really do have language impairments and students who do not. Let's take a deeper look at this study from 2017 by Hendricks and Adloff. In this study, the researchers administered the CELL-4 and the DELV-S to 299 second grade students from South Carolina. Now, the issue with the CELL is that items might be scored incorrectly for mainstream American English, even though they might be correct for other language varieties. But the DELVS doesn't do that because it only uses items that would be acceptable in both of those language varieties. 
So the researchers use these assessments to investigate how modifying the scoring affected the diagnostic accuracy of the self for Black African American participants who spoke AAE. Now, if you remember, we have a standard that we need to uphold when we are judging whether a test has enough uh, validity that so that we could be able to use it to assess students. It needs to be 80 or 90% the Banton Plant standard to be fair and 90 or better to be good. If it's less than 80, it's unacceptable and we should not be using that assessment. Without modifications, 88% of students with language impairment in this study were accurately identified. 48% of typically developing students were accurately identified, meaning over 50% were not identified correctly with the self. What about with modification? Surely that's gonna help. That's gonna make things better, right? Well, 63% of students with language impairment were accurately identified and 63% of typically developing students were accurately identified. This is unacceptable. We have to think very carefully about the assessments we're using because as we agree, language varies and all languages are equal in linguistic terms. So if we're using assessments, even with modifications that are penalizing our students for their language varieties, we are not doing our jobs correctly and we are not following ethical practice. Hello, my name is Chelsea Summer and I am an assistant professor at Florida International University and a bilingual speech language pathologist at Nicholas Children's Hospital here in Miami, Florida. I also help to teach part of the bilingual extension at Teachers College Columbia University in New York. Today, I will be discussing issues with vocabulary tests and ethical considerations moving forward. So when we're assessing for language, we wanna make sure that we're actually assessing for language. And this goes back to the idea of validity. Is the test measuring what we want it to measure or is it measuring something else? When we're testing for just using vocabulary tests, that's not a natural linguistic experience. It's just solely accounting for the number of words the child has. And labeling in itself is a very mainstream culture task. From birth, children are taught body parts, shapes, numbers, colors, and to label in books, what is this, what is that? but some children don't have those same experiences. So is it functional what we're doing? A study by Pena and Quinn in 1997 looked at Head Start programs, specifically looking at African-American children and children from Puerto Rican backgrounds. They found that children did better on familiar tasks such as functionality. So what do you use a stove for? Why might you do this? Or why might you use that? as opposed to a traditional vocabulary test that relied on labeling, such as the expressive one word picture vocabulary test. Familiar tasks were better at distinguishing between children with low language skills and children who had typical language. Socioeconomic status has also been associated with language processing differences. A longitudinal study by Ferdinand and colleagues in 2012 studied infants from 18 to 24 months of age. The results at 18 months of age show that when compared to peers from their high SES group, children from the low SES group had smaller vocabularies and had slower language processing efficiency. These results persisted until 24 months of age where children had smaller vocabularies and there was also a six month gap for language processing skills for the children from the lower SES group. There are also biases towards socioeconomic status and bilingualism. The self for Spanish over identified low income Spanish English bilinguals. There was an incorrect over identification of a language disorder that occurred for one out of every three Latino children from a low SES group. Therefore, one out of three typically developing children were identified as having a language disorder 
when they did not have a language disorder. This might be due to the fact that they were from a low SES group or that they were bilingual. We cannot say for sure. However, we do know that we should not use this test for English Spanish bilingual children or children from a low SES group. Do not use scores with children from a low SES population and for dual language learners. We must use converging evidence and different approaches to assess for language. Moving on and more evidence that there are biases towards socioeconomic status in vocabulary testing. A study by Horton, Ickard, and Weismer in 2007 wanted to assess the effect of socioeconomic status on lexical skills in African-American children. The study looked at 30 African-American children, 15 from a low SES group and 15 from a middle SES group. They looked at standardized vocabulary tests, the number of different words from language samples, as well as a fast mapping task for word learning. The results show that receptive and expressive standardized test scores were lower for toddlers from low SES backgrounds than for toddlers from a middle SES background. Children from low socioeconomic background had fewer words from their language sample than their peers from the middle SES group. However, there were no differences in fast mapping. So the children from both socioeconomic groups did similarly on a fast mapping task. And this is like a novel word learning task. So teaching a child a new word and seeing their ability to learn that new word and to recall that new word. So this measure was not biased towards socioeconomic status. In conclusion, socioeconomic status does influence performance on vocabulary testing, but fast mapping, such as novel word learning tasks, are not biased. There are different ways we can account for vocabulary, although they are not perfect and they do not hit sensitivity and specificity measures, I did want to mention them. So we can use total scoring and that's where we account for a child's vocabulary in one language and another language and add it together. And there's also conceptual scoring. So the child, um, if they don't answer correctly in one language, they're allowed to respond in the other language and they get credit for having that concept. Um, a study looking, comparing at total scoring versus conceptual scoring on kids from 22 months of age to 30 months of age found that using conceptual scoring alone resulted in smaller vocabulary. And they found that by using a total scoring approach in which they gave the CDI in both languages in English and in Spanish and added up both of those languages, using that total vocabulary identified the same proportion of bilingual children below the 25th percentile on monolingual norms as the CDI did for monolingual children. So this is a really important finding because again, bilingualism does not cause disorder and the prevalence figures for bilinguals and monolinguals should be the same. So they found that using total scoring in this early intervention population was most related to monolingual norms. When looking at older children and vocabulary assessment measures, they found that conceptual scoring um, resulted in conceptual scoring across different test administration time points actually resulted in higher scores and the best classification. However, if we actually look at this article and look into the sensitivity and the specificity, although that was, you know, resulted in the highest scores and the best classification, um, the sensitivity and the specificity is still unacceptable. Therefore, labeling tests in general and vocabulary tests are going to over-identify children with a language disorder potentially. So what can we do moving forward based on all of this evidence-based practice and research that we've shared today? So do not rely on a test score. We know that these tests are psychometrically flawed and they do not hit our validity and reliability standards that are necessary. If you um, have not had experience looking at test reviews and the psychometric properties of a test, I encourage you to look at the test manuals and also look at the test reviews that can be found on leadersproject.org. Several authors and researchers such as Castilla Earls and colleagues in 2020 suggested that we could use multiple pieces of assessment data to come together and trend in the same direction to make a diagnostic decision. So these researchers suggested collecting language experience questionnaires, 
a bilingual language sample analysis, an evaluation of learning potential such as dynamic assessment measures, as well as standardized testing. However, we do know that the most commonly used standardized tests in our field fail to meet those psychometric standards, as I said earlier. And again, we must know how to judge and analyze the psychometric properties of these measures. This does not mean that we should jump to another test. This means that we need to assess the manual and assess the psychometric properties of that test. Thank you so much for all your time. Hi everyone, I'm Katrina falcher Rude. I'm an educator, researcher, and speech language pathologist. I'm the lead instructor and content creator at the Big Picture SLP. The Big Picture SLP is an online continuing education marketplace and our big goal over at the Big Picture is to teach clinicians how to take external scientific evidence and bring it to life and translate it into everyday clinical practice. And so I'm really here to address what is currently happening in child language assessment. And what my colleagues and I have found from various surveys that we have conducted, as well as doing qualitative semi-structured interviews, is that SLPs, primarily these are school-based SLPs, will report using a combination of standardized testing and informal measures. Now, while school-based SLPs will report using a variety of these tools, we have found that standardized testing is the most relied upon tool in terms of what tools are used, why they're used, and the tool that is the tool and the data that is relied upon most to make diagnostic decisions about which children uh, do and do not have language impairments. And from an unpublished survey that we're looking at, we know that 80% of school-based SLPs are reporting using two or more standardized tests for their diagnostic and evaluative decisions. So why is standardized testing so pervasive? Why is it that primary assessment tool? So again, my colleagues and I in a qualitative interview asked SLPs why they rely on standardized testing. Why is this an assessment tool that they used? And these were four of the primary themes that they discussed about rationale for using standardized tests. And especially SLPs really are relying on these tools because they measure specific skills in a way that is they believe is comprehensive and they can do this in a way that is easy to administer and is time effective. And in addition, many SLPs are mistakenly perceiving that standardized testing is mandatory in school settings because of districts, uh, policies, or different laws or policies that at, at the district, state, or other federal and local levels. And what you're really going to be seeing as you're going through this course is that while you're perceiving standardized testing as a mandatory component and as maybe the most important or only data that you need to use for diagnostic decision making, this is really not the case. And so is it ethical and is this part of evidence-based practice to rely so heavily upon standardized testing when making diagnostic decisions? The short answer here is no. Any evaluator who's only using one test to identify a disability or a language impairment is really violating evidence-based practice and is going against the ASHA code of ethics. And as SLPs, we really need to make sure that we understand how standardized testing is built and that we are considering the psychometric qualities, the reliability, the validity, and the diagnostic accuracy of standardized testing to make sure it is really appropriate for the children that we are assessing. And so, there are major concerns with standardized testing. Not all standardized tests that SLPs are using to diagnose language impairment are reliable, valid, and are diagnostically accurate. So one question to ask yourself in selecting standardized assessments is, does this standardized test that I'm using include measures of discriminant accuracy, like sensitivity and specificity? Is it actually designed to diagnose children with language impairments? And how has that been tested?
And does your standardized test as it updated and does it consider what we now know about child language development or is it still being built on theories that were 30 that were used 30 40 or 50 years ago and think about your own unique identity as a human being and all of its intersections um, all of your different interests all of the parts that make up who you are where you came from, your religious background, ethnic background, racial background. How does that all impact testing performance? And do you really think all of those idiosyncrasies and intersections can accurately be uh, caught and measured by a standardized test? I really don't think that's the case. And what about evidence-based practice? Something that we know as school-based SLPs we need to be following. Again, in our study as well as other studies, we found that when discussing evidence-based practices, school-based pract uh, school practitioners are really viewing this as something that we do for treatment and not for assessment, which is a huge barrier and a huge impact. Evidence-based practice is for all of the services we render, assessment and treatment. And that SLPs are typically using external scientific research evidence under two very specific circumstances. One, when they feel that they lack the clinical expertise or they haven't had specific one-on-one -on -one experience with that client's diagnosis. And in the second instance, when they need to provide evidence to, or support to other professionals or other parents about a treatment method that they're already utilizing. I really believe that this isn't the essence of what evidence-based practice is. In addition, SLPs may not be always accessing the best, most high quality peer reviewed research evidence. And that typically sources that are going from general internet searches on Google or ASHA is what's being used. And so we really need to consider and do some self-reflection on our own practices and really understand what we're using to assess, why we assess them, and are they reaching the ultimate language goals of correctly diagnosing children with language impairment?